Hello and welcome to the Prisoner Officer Podcast. This podcast is a place to talk about the forgotten cops in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do. If you haven't done so yet, please visit www.theprisonofficer.com. This is a great time to go to the Prison Officer Podcast website. While you're there, order an official Prison Officer Podcast coffee mug to drink your favorite beverage from while you listen to our podcast. Just click the Shop Now button and choose the design of your choice for you or as a gift for your favorite prison officer. The hosting platform for a Prison Officer Podcast is Buzzsprout. First, let me tell you, I love Buzzsprout. They've helped me in every step of the way in building and bringing this podcast to you. And one of the nice things that Buzzsprout did was send me a compiled list of 2020 statistics for the Prison Officer Podcast. And I'd like to share some of those with you. 2020 was the first year for the Prison Officer Podcast, and despite many challenges last year, it was a great year for the podcast. So let's take a moment and uh, celebrate our 2020 accomplishments on the Prisoner Officer Podcast. The Prisoner Officer Podcast published 15 episodes in 2020. The first episode, titled Introduction, was published on March 29th of last year. In 2020, the Prison Officer Podcast published more than four hours of combined content. That's about 265 minutes, or 15,929 seconds, just for your listening pleasure. There have been more than 7,700 downloads of the Prisoner Officer Podcast, And in 2020, the most popular episode of the Prison Officer Podcast was Episode 2, How I Became a Prison Officer. This was apparently everybody's favorite episode. I would be interested if you'd leave a comment and tell me what your favorite episode was last year. In 2020, the Prison Officer Podcast has been downloaded by more than 30 countries. Now, this was extremely surprising to me, but I'll, I'll walk you through this. 63% of the listenership of the Prisoner Officer Podcast is United States. 21% is Australia. 6% United Kingdom. And then Canada, Ireland, New Zealand. In 2020, the Prison Officer Podcast was downloaded 240 times from the most popular city on the podcast. Can anybody guess what that is? Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. That really surprised me, but I'm very happy that you guys are listening down under. The longest episode was episode 13, and that was the interview with the 100-year-old prison officer, Robert Bob Burks, and that came in at 54 minutes. The shortest episode was episode 1, which of course was just the introduction, and it came in at 6 minutes. In 2020, fans of the Prison Officer Podcast listened mostly using Spotify, Apple was number two, and iHeartRadio was number three. So that kind of tells you where we've been, and and, uh, I hope you found some of that interesting because I know I did when I got to see those statistics. But now that we've reviewed 2020, let's take a look at what I think are some of the top challenges for corrections in 2021. It's almost certain that the events of 2020 have permanently changed the American way of life, as well as the American people. Even corrections will feel the effects of a year consumed by masks, social distancing, polarizing political opinions, homeschooling, telework, and the deaths of so many loved ones. Many people who celebrated the end of 2020 are hoping for a much better 2021, but the effects of 2020 are going to remain as we recover and we respond to the multiple changes that will linger into this year. So what will be the top challenges for corrections in the upcoming year? Well, I'm going to say that COVID is still going to be the top challenge for us. It's changed the way we work. It's changed the fact that we have to have more PPE. We're wearing masks constantly. Uh, I even will stop and say that with the people I've talked to, searches aren't getting done like they used to be because, of course, people are uh, more nervous about going into these cells and doing these things that, uh, you know, pat searches and cell searches because you're putting yourself in that proximity and we're, we're getting used to this social distancing and social distancing is a horrible thing for prison because those inmates will take advantage of the fact that we have put a distance between them and us. So that's going to linger. 
and the effects of COVID-19 are far from over in our prisons and our communities and the world. You know, the vaccines, they're, they're being tested, evaluated, and they're being administered right now as I write this. Uh, I know in town I drove through all ago and they had a line at the, the health department of people who were getting their vaccine. But the production of this vaccine, in my opinion, is not going to be a magic wand that rids us of COVID. It's going to take years to produce and vaccinate the global population. But even then, not everyone's going to get vaccinated. You know, I was looking the other day, and according to the World Health Organization, an estimated 19.7 million children under the age of one have not received even the basic childhood vaccines. And these have been available for decades. So getting everyone globally to take the COVID vaccine or get it to them or make it available is going to be very unlikely, which is going to leave us in corrections dealing with it. Many of you already know we have inmates that come in from other countries, and a lot of times they're bringing stuff that we don't see, at least in America, we don't see a whole lot of tuberculosis. But we do have inmates that come into our prison system that are positive with tuberculosis. My expectation is that COVID is going to kind of run that course. We're going to have it under control, but there's always going to be someone, some inmate bringing it in. So staff in our prisons and jails, we're going to be dealing with this. And we're going to be dealing with those inmates that slip through the system. So one of the other things I think is going to be one of the biggest challenges of uh, 2021 is, of course, recruitment and retention. Recruitment and retention of existing employees will be one of the largest priorities of all correctional agencies and departments. Many agencies are offering recruitment bonuses right now just to bring in candidates. I know the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and the Alaska Department of Corrections are both currently offering a $5,000 recruitment bonus for correctional officers. And also many institutions in the Federal Bureau of Prisons have bonuses at a level I've never seen before. There's always been a few, but right now there are dozens and dozens of prisons who are paying these bonuses. And right now one of them to include is the newest United States Penitentiary at Thompson, Illinois which is offering a 25% relocation and recruitment incentive. And that's for all departments. That's not just correctional officers. Um, so you're going to continue to see this. Um, these retention bonuses, the recruitment drives. I've, I've seen posted on Facebook more and more and more recruitment drives, sometimes every month. And this isn't something we've seen before. And a lot of this, in my opinion, is a, a public perception of law enforcement You've got a lot of people who aren't looking towards law enforcement and corrections as a viable option. So that's going to be a that's going to continue to be a big challenge in 2021. Another big challenge is wellness. Correctional officers are one of the essential workers having to continue, you know, security and care for inmates despite this COVID epidemic or pandemic. Social distancing is not an option for us. And exposure is a very real possibility every day. Besides the daily stress of just being a correctional officer, now staff have to also deal with, you know, death of inmates, maybe death of family members, and or even other correctional staff. Just recently lost a, a correctional officer that I knew, and um, he died from COVID. So this type of stress is manifesting itself on top of just the stress that officers are dealing with by working in a prison. It seems like just, oh, well, that's just this, or that's just, you know, why aren't you just dealing with this person passing away? But, you know, studies are finding that cumulative post-traumatic stress disorder, cumulative, is one of the most dangerous forms of PTSD. There's PTSD out there that happened from a traumatic event, and then there's PTSD they're finding that happens cumulatively over a long period of time. So you have a lot of triggers over months, years, whatever, until it finally builds up. And it can be as debilitating as that one-time event that causes PTSD. And because this gradually builds up over time, it makes symptoms you know, difficult to detect until they manifest you know, in some sort of destructive manner. And correctional officers and other first responders are particularly vulnerable to this. And they're also very hard to identify with this because 
We are very good at controlling our emotions. We're very good at controlling what other people see. Um, and so it makes it really hard to identify that this may be going on until it's gotten to a point that it's hard to handle. Watch out for each other. You know, check on your fellow officer. Ask them, how are you doing? And, and most importantly, most importantly, take, take a minute to stop and listen. When you ask them how they're doing, listen. It, don't just ask them and let them get away with, I'm fine. Pay attention to what's going on with them. So another, I think, challenge that we're going to see, and we've already seen a lot of this, but you're seeing, uh, I think, every day uh, I see on Facebook or one of the social media sites where they're posting, some officers posting where they found an inmate making a TikTok from his cell or, or uh, posting to his Facebook page from his cell. So we're dealing with technology in a way that we haven't before. And not only are cell phones going to be a challenge for us, detecting, finding cell phones, but I also think uh, drones. I think, um, you know, a lot of the prisons are having problems with drone drops. It's almost impossible to stop. So those type of technologies, the contraband, are going to be tough. One of the other technologies I think to watch out for in 2021 is corrections is going to be focusing on technology like body cameras. You know, with a long history of being resistant to technology, um, this may be the year that corrections must embrace some of these new technologies in order to just uh, improve transparency and to help build community trust in corrections because people are looking at that close. And despite the fact that most correctional centers and jails have dozens, if not hundreds, of closed-circuit televisions, Body cameras are being worn by officers, and this brings up a whole new set of challenges. Police have been wearing body cams for years outside the fence. But imagine an inmate with a lawsuit, and he files for discovery of a body cam video taken inside a correctional facility. So what parts of this can he see? If we allow him to see the body cam, is there physical layout and security information, you know, that... Uh, shouldn't be shown to that inmate that's going to help him or, or someone else in an escape plan once it once uh, you know it's turned over to the lawyer or to the inmate. What about the privacy of non-involved inmates? There's a lot of things to work on with um, corrections and body cams because this is a new field for us and a new area for us, many of us. But one good thing, state legislatures, uh, you know, they're already proposing and passing laws to deal with with some of these challenges, and uh, but they're going to need to provide direction specifically for corrections staff. You know, a lot of the body camera language is made for LEOs outside the fence, and they're going to have to deal with what affects us. You know, we're we're dealing with security on the inside. One of the other challenges I think we're going to see in 2021, and this is fairly recent in the news, is private prisons. Now. Following an executive action, which was signed by now President Joe Biden uh, on January 27th, his executive order said that the Department of Justice will not renew existing contracts with private prison companies. And I've already heard this a lot, and I guess I'm going to try to clear up a little bit of this. This has been construed by the media and many others as the end to private prisons. But the reality is that although I'm sure that the loss of, you know, DOJ, Federal Bureau of Prisons revenue, that that's going to affect the private prison industry, it's not going to end private prisons. You know, the Associated Press noted that the, the Bureau of Prisons has already opted not to renew some private prison contracts in recent months as the number of inmates dwindled and thousands were released to home confinement because of the coronavirus pandemic. So... The Bureau of Prisons is already stepping back from not needing as many private prisons to house some of their low-security inmates. Currently, there are about 14,095 federal inmates in privately managed facilities. This is about 9% of the total federal inmate population of 151,735. The majority of Bureau of Prisons inmates in private prisons are low-security. These are sentenced criminal aliens who may be deported upon the completion of their sentence. A lot of people don't know that. The private prisons aren't saving big chunks of money on the high-security inmates. Anybody that's worked in prison knows 
it takes a lot more money per inmate to house a high security inmate or a high publicity inmate. Inmates that take a lot more staff and that take a lot more resources. Low security, they're at the low end of the cost spectrum. So that's what the private prisons are even handling for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. But, you know, the executive order that President Biden signed, you know, it stated more than 2 million people are currently incarcerated in the United States, which is true, including a disproportionate number of people of color. There is broad consensus that our current system of mass incarceration imposes significant costs and hardships on our society and communities and does not make us safer. Privately operated criminal detention facilities consistently underperform federal facilities with respect to correctional services, programs, and resources. Now, I find that to be, number one, uncalled for, but number two, I, 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 that's not truth. That depends on who you talk to, and that's an opinion. Sure, he may have found somebody that said that private prisons don't do the job as well as federal, but... I've visited a couple of private prisons over the years, and I can say that the last part of that is simply not true. In many ways, our private prisons are outperforming the government facilities. What I didn't see during my visits is the complacency that has crept into our unionized prisons, where employees with poor work ethic are not only tolerated, but they're often rewarded. Sure, all departments and agencies have problems, but there are many examples of the private prisons doing things the right way. During my visits, I found motivated, professional staff who were eager to show off how efficient things run in a private prison. And besides that, I also ran into inmates who were engaged, and they were very proud of their own accomplishments and what they were going to do when they got out. And this is at a level that I don't normally see in the prisons I've worked in, in the federal and state prisons I've worked in. Another thing that people don't think about with the private prisons, at least 11 countries spread across North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and Oceania are engaged in some level of prison privatization. While the United States maintains the highest total number of privately held prisoners, but we have the highest total number of prisoners, Australia, Scotland, England, and Wales, and New Zealand hold a larger proportion of prisoners in the private facilities. Australia is as high as 19% of their total inmate populations being held in private prisons. So private prisons are out there, they're working, and President Joe Biden's executive order, yes, it's probably gonna hurt some of the private prisons, but it's not putting an end to private prisons. So that's a mis misnomer that people have in their head out there that, that's not true. Private prisons are not going away. So I guess the last thing I'll talk about, and this was a big part of last year, it's been a growing debate over the last several years, but, um, and Corrections has always had a problem with public perception, but last year it seems like it really went towards law enforcement as a whole. And I don't know that we were lumped in as hard as some of the, the police agencies were, but as a whole, public servants I think took a hit last year. You know, last year saw a nation who no longer looks at law enforcement and corrections as a public service. They look at it as a political issue that requires an opinion. Everybody's got an opinion now. Groups who advocate ideas from defunding the police to defunding prisons can be seen daily in the news headlines right now. And corrections in America is also dealing with the effects of changing attitudes towards the the war on drugs. The public perception of drugs has changed and whether or not inmates should be incarcerated for drugs. As of November 2020, 15 states have legalized recreational marijuana and more than 35 states allow medical marijuana. It's not that long ago that a lot of our lower security inmates were in there for some type of drugs or drug paraphernalia and a lot of it had to do with marijuana. So now it's legal in a bunch of the states. So where do we go from there? Even with the changing attitude towards drugs, some states are closing their prisons due to finances. You know, California, Colorado, Minnesota, and Oregon have all announced multiple prison closures, or they're considering closures in an effort to address budget crises 
you know, that are caused by the reduced tax revenue amid the COVID-19 pandemic. One reason that states can close prisons is because prison populations have declined. You know, the population peak was in 2009, but since then, prison populations have declined. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, more than 170,000 inmates have been released from jails and prisons in the United States. Some jurisdictions have stopped accepting offenders with nonviolent misdemeanor charges, and public defenders are seeking to release some of their clients from jail without even posting bail. Many people see this as an experiment to see whether, you know, nonviolent offenders can be handled without incarceration. Others see it as a, a surefire way to raise the crime rates in the U.S. Only in 2021 will be able to tell us, you know, what works and what doesn't. I know myself, when I started working in prison, the low, end, the low security inmates who were working at the camps or living at the camps, they were going out every day and they had jobs and they were working. And many of them were working, you know, on military bases or other government facilities. But I know in the last few years, what I've seen is low security inmates who are camping out. They're, they're just living in camps. They're going to commissary. You know, they might take a class. They're playing on the, the yard. But as far as unless they've got an orderly job, we've taken away a lot of that work that was getting done by those inmates. And yes, there's a changing perception on that. There's a lot of people out there that don't think an inmate should be forced to work. My personal opinion is, if we're going to take these low-level offenders and we're going to put them places like camps behind a single fence or behind no fence, and we're not going to work them and we're not going to work to teach them how to be better people, then yeah, I see no reason for us to spend what, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 per inmate a year on each one of those, keeping them incarcerated? If we're not going to put them behind a fence and we're not going to teach them something, then maybe that is what we need to do. Maybe we should um, have fewer low custody inmates. Well, I think I covered a lot of stuff there and I, you know, that's it for today's episode. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or, or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Till next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back. And please take care of each other out there behind those walls.